What were you working on when you were cast for the role? What was I working on? Well, I, I, when I was cast, in, no, no, when I, uh, when I was cast with Wise Guy, I was working on uh, again, like I said, my one-man show, A Bronx Tale. I was uh, a New York actor, came out to L.A., relatively unknown out there in L.A. in Hollywood, and then I just wrote this play called The Bronx Tale, and I was doing it, and it just became the hottest property in uh, all over, and everybody wanted to know me and wanted to, wanted to play. And David Burke, the producer, executive producer and writer, saw it, saw it, saw it, and he just said, hey, I want you to be in the show. And that's how it started. That's great. I remember that you were, that was, Rob's was so hot. Oh. Everybody, it was a great story. It was a great story, yeah. Story about you. Yeah. Um, so, how did, you, how did you prepare for the role in Wise Guy? Well, I was very fortunate that my best friend in the whole world, my best friend Phil Folia, uh, ran for the uh, Bronx District Attorney, and he worked with Rudy Giuliani, and he was a notorious prosecutor, and he loved to put people in jail. Oh, he loved it. In fact, when he became a defense lawyer, he hated it. He, he just didn't really like it at all. He, he just loved to be on the other side. So him being my best friend, all I had to do was really talk to him a lot, and I really got a lot of research from him and how he felt about putting people away, especially Italian Americans, and even though he is one himself, but he thought that it was his duty to show that there are that the fabric of the Italian American community is built up of the working man, the the butcher, the cop, the fireman, the bus driver, and and I felt always felt the same way. And if you look at Bronx Tale, it was very important to me to show that the working man is the tough guy, not the mobster. And that's why in Bronx Tale, when the father says, "I'm the tough guy," it doesn't take much strength to pull the trigger, but try to get up in the morning every day and work for a living. That's a tough guy. So with all that I had growing up. And with Phil's research, it was pretty easy to play Peter Alatore. And also Sal, too, when I played the wise guy. So I had kind of both ends. Yeah, great answer. Um, can you talk about your acting method? And um, did you rehearse scenes with the other actors? Was there a particular method that you brought to wise guy? Well, uh, I get that answer. yeah, well, my, my, acting, my acting method is really... Uh, uh, I, I, like I said, I am a member of the actor's studio, but I've studied a lot of different techniques uh, in, the, in the past, God knows, 30 years. Well, uh, some people at the studio just do the method, and the method is a wonderful way of working. But I like to, I like to study with a lot of different teachers because I believe uh, acting is like religion. You know, No matter what religion you have, it all leads to one God. So no matter all these techniques that you have, it all leads to one thing, and that's the truth. So in each different episode or each different movie or whenever I'm doing a play, I take pieces of all the different techniques that I studied and I use them accordingly to what I, what I need. That's something our tagline acting is like religion. That's great. Um, and in particular, what was your uh, experience like uh, working with Jonathan Banks, uh, Robert Davi, and, and Ken Wall? Well, my experience working with uh, uh, Robert Davi and, and Jonathan Banks and Ken Wall was great. I mean, they're all wonderful actors just really terrific actors and they're very giving and it's not about them it's not about me it's about the scene it's about the work and I remember the episode I did with uh, uh, the one where I played Sal Desimone his last name what was his last name I forgot his last name uh, the gangster in a black and Sal Rosselli that's right and I me and me and Ken will have this big scene and I get slapped around and he beats me up and he kisses the girl and I got up, and I, I was laughing, and, and Kenny said to me, he goes, don't worry, Chaz, one day you'll be beating people up and kissing the girl, and that's when you know you're doing well. And I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and we laughed about it. But uh, Kenny was very generous. That's a great answer. We're going to come back to that beating up part, too, because that's very interesting. Uh, um, the sets and locations were great. Um, was there anything interesting, anything funny that happened on location with this group? Uh, not, not, not really. When I say funny, you know, the thing about Wise Guys is not only the stars were such great actors, even the side people, even the, even the people that didn't have a lot of lines were such characters. Uh, David Burke and Steve Cronish really used kind of real New York guys. Uh, there was this one wonderful actor. Uh, he's been in a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, Bobby Miranda. Uh, just really a terrific actor and funny. And, and the great thing about it was in Wise Guy, when David, when David was directing, they allowed us to improvise and ad-lib and use our culture. And so... Uh, a lot of times I was saying, what line, you know, Bobby would always ad-lib, but I was laughing going, you know, what movie are we doing? Is this the same movie? And we would laugh all the time. So that was kind of funny. Um, I mean, I think you're exactly right. It was such a rich tapestry. The yes. It was incredible. Um, it's obvious that show was ahead of its time. Yes. At the time, 
Did you feel you were doing a show that was ahead of its time? You know, you never feel like you're doing something when you're doing it ahead of its time. But you know it's, it's something special because it wasn't the number one show, but they couldn't take it off the air. So people were watching it. But sometimes in art, nothing gets appreciated really in its time. It's always like years later. If you look at Raging Bull, which was a fabulous movie, in its time the reviews were okay, good, and it didn't really make money. And then as years went on now, 25 years later, it became the greatest movie you know, of the 80s, of the, of the decade. Uh, and who, now I think it's one of the great movies of all time, top 10 movies. So nothing gets appreciated in its time. Nothing. Even, even Mike, uh, Michelangelo's uh, Piazza, when he, when he carved it out of stone, nobody saw it. Nobody wanted to go see it. He was so disgusted he left Rome and left. And years later, now we look at it and it's a masterpiece. So true art never gets sometimes accepted in its time. Um, was this, uh, uh, a career influencing role for you with Wise Guys? Wise guy. I think Wise Guy absolutely was a career influencing role because at that time I was doing a lot of theater in New York and then at that time I went out to LA and this was the first time where I really got a chance to really like show myself for a, a lot of people you know I did a few episodes of Peter Alatori then I did all of a sudden then I did a complete opposite character of this wise guy in a black and white episode so it was a real showcase for me to let people not only was I known doing the play but now all of a sudden I was doing something really hot on television so I think it was good. Um, and I want to talk now about that black and white episode. You know, personally, I hadn't seen it since it was on TV. Right. And then I watched the clips again. Right. I mean, it's beautiful. Right. It's riveting. It's, it's a very powerful work. Um, did you, the fact that it was in black and white, did that affect your performance? Oh, no. No, I was so happy when I heard it was going to be in black and white. And then when I heard who was going to shoot it, which was William Franca, who was really a great, great DP, great cinematographer, I was very flattered to to be in that episode because I knew that he would make us look really great and, and to do something so daring on television, black and white, I mean, it's unheard of. Nobody does that. But I guess from the power of Stephen Cannell, Stephen Cannell who just said, hey, this is the way it's going to be and they said, Stephen, whatever you want to do. So uh, I was really happy to be in it. Um, and on that set, was there anything out of the ordinary that happened? Anything that uh, comes to memory that you thought was different, either funny or unusual? Well, we, were, we kept laughing, telling stories, because it was in the 60s, and we, we, we started talking about what it was like in the 60s, and all the girls had this big, big hair, and uh, it was just fun. We, we just kind of, it was kind of being young again, you know? When I was, like, in my 20s, I was like, wow, this is, yeah, I remember this, you know? I remember that hairdo. I remember these cars, you know, with the suicide doors, the Lincoln Continental. So it was just, just going back in time. It was really fun. So yeah, that's a great episode. Um... And in, uh, in that, you were working with Patty... Uh, Patty Dobbinville. Yeah. What was that like? Patty Dobbinville is a, real, is a real treat. She's a wonderful actor, a wonderful actor. And she's the real deal. When you want somebody to play that type of character with an edge who's also funny but sensitive, the great thing about Patty Dobbinville is she can do so many different colors in a character, and that's what makes her so, so, so unique and so terrific. And then in, this, uh, in that episode, you're coming back on the other side of the fence, so to speak. So you're playing a monster. Right. And so how is it different working with Ken Wall on that respect? When I, was, when I played a monster, uh, when I played a mobster. Well, uh, it was different working with Ken Wall in the, in the black and white episode because now all of a sudden I'm in the color episodes where I'm this lawyer, where I'm this district attorney who's running for governor, and I fight with him now in the black and white episode, which ran can, right after that, I play this mobster. And I said to, I, I did grow a mustache I had, and I said to David Burke, I said, gee, isn't that going to be strange? And David said, no, it's, it's really supposed to be from Kenny's dream. All this is, you know, he's, he, it's his memory. And it was like a memory piece thinking about his father. So uh, in dreams, sometimes people replace other people. So I thought that was really interesting. So uh, uh, I like the idea when he told me that. It is so, uh, it's so different than other pieces that have similar themes. If you think about the Godfather movies when they're revisiting the past. Right. But this was, it's much more dreamlike. It's very surreal. Very surreal, much more dreamlike. And uh, that's, what made it, that's what made it real fun to do. I mean, it's nice because they're so different. Peter Alatori is so different than Sal. Sal Roselli, you know, the two different types of characters. They speak different, they act different. Where Peter Alatoli is very dignified, where I got that from my friend Phil Foley, he's a very dignified, stand up, tall, speaks very eloquently, and talks about the Italian American experience. Where Sal is much more, you know, you know, you know hey, you know, cuts, you know, very street. So it was, it was a totally different character, so it was a lot of fun to play. Um, I want to hear about the, uh, the scenes with Fatty in your office. 
Right. Uh, how many times did you get slapped? Well, so, Fatty slapped me a few times, <clears throat> and it wasn't hard enough. And I didn't like the way it was reading. It was reading fake. And, any, and one thing that could really upset an actor is if something is reading fake. So I, I leaned over to him, and I, I said, listen, you know, I forgot the actor's name. He was a wonderful actor. I forgot his name, but I said, you know, I said, no, I, I've been slapped before. You know, I can handle it. Let me have it. I said, I'm, I'm okay. Fine. With that, we go, action. Well, this guy, first of all, has got a hand like a shovel. And he tees off. I said, let me have it. But I didn't say, kill me. He tees off and hits me. If you watch that, he hits me with a slap that I almost jumped up and I wanted to, like, drop him. You know, and it just worked for the, if you, it works for that scene because he really connected and, you know, he, he spun my head around. It was great for the movie, but I didn't want to do take two, to be honest with you. Um, so, um, so now let's talk about the fight scene with him. Right. Um, did you do your own stunts on that? Uh, no, 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 absolutely not. One thing about actors, uh, you know, when, you, when you're young, you say, yeah, you tell the director, I'll, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. But when you get old, you say, no, no way. Because, first of all, the stunt people can do it much better than I can. That's what they get paid for. Stunt people, actor, two different people. So I always tell the director, when it's time to be thrown over the chair and over the table, he does it. I don't do it. Because I get hurt. All of a sudden, now I can't work. I got a family. No. So I did uh, the box. See, I, I was a boxer. Uh, so that part, I did the throwing punches. I wanted to look really good because I, I know how to box. But when the, when the time came where he had attacked me and threw me over the table and the tables fall, that was a stuntman. That's my next question because it's obviously been a boxer. What's the connection between boxing and acting? I don't know if there's a connection. I mean, it's, uh, my dad was a bus driver, and he also trained fighters. He's still alive today. He's 84 years old. He still trains fighters. And uh, I started in the fight game when I was very young. When I was six, seven years old, I was already a pretty good boxer. And by the time I was 13, I was actually, you know, the wise guys wanted to, like, take me on. But my dad said that uh, my son doesn't want to fight. My, my son likes to go out with girls, leave my son alone. So, and which was true. I didn't, ha I didn't have it to really be a fighter. I enjoyed doing it. I liked to defend myself. And I was good at it, but I didn't have that, like, that thing that you have to have, that animalistic killer instinct to really become a great fighter. I didn't have that. Um, so, so I got off, uh, I was just going to personally ask you about it. So uh, in the fight scene with Kim Wall, did you, uh, and if I could get you to do the question back and the answer, uh, did you do multiple takes of that scene? Did you have to shoot that several times? Yeah, and any time, uh, not, not overly a lot of times. We, we had to shoot that scene, you know, not, not, uh, to the point where it became ridiculous. No, I, I, we were pretty set on it. We worked it out, Kenny and I, how I was going to hit him. And uh, he was very good with that. You know, It's really, in a fight scene, it's really the person who gets the blow that sells it, not the person who gives it. People don't realize that. People think it's the guy who throws the punch. It's really not. It's the guy who takes the punch. He's the one who really sells the fight, not the one who's hitting. And Kenny was very good at that. Um, Wise Guy's action was almost filming. I think it was a big step ahead for TV drama. Uh, how important do you think action was to the show? I think action was very important to the show in Wise Guy. Uh, not only, well, because they were willing to spend the money and do certain things with helicopters and planes, and, and that really comes from Stephen, you know, Stephen Canal, who just wanted the best for it and wanted the right thing done. You know, Stephen is really, I don't, I, I, I don't know him, but I see his work and I've seen him on interviews and I've seen him and I know him through David Burke and he seems like a man who really wants things the right way and that's what I really like. So, uh, one of the reasons why Wise is coming out I mean, right. is it has its following still. Right. I mean, it has a huge following. Um, is there anything uh, that you could tell these fans uh, about Wise Guy from your perspective? Why do you think it's special? I think that Wise Guy is special, and the reason why we're doing this DVD right now is because something that is truly great lasts. Not only does it last, it gets better and better. Like wine, it gets better with time. And people sometimes you know, didn't appreciate it as much as probably they do now. Because if you look at television now, with all these reality shows, and, a lot, and the bar has really dropped down as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm concerned on television. But if you look at something like Wise Guy, who talked about this guy who was undercover for the, <clears throat> uh, for the FBI, a man who had to juggle his family life and his, and his gangster life, you realize it was way before Donnie Brasco. It was way before Goodfellas. It was before all of these things that it truly was a piece of art ahead of its time, and it's only going to get better. 
And typically, you, you, I would have made the comparison to the Sopranos. Oh, well. Film actor, and you're making the comparison <clears throat> to the TV shows. Yeah. Uh, uh, films, which I think is unusual. Yeah, well, uh, I, I just thought it was, uh, well, I mean, The Sopranos is a different type. Obviously, it's Sopranos is the life of the mobster, where Wise Guys, we were dealing with the life of the agent. Uh, both were very well-written shows, but just different. Okay. Um, so, I think that's all I have. Anything okay. you want to add? Anything you want to say? Did I miss anything you think is important? No, I'm just, uh, on a personal note, I'm just glad that uh, uh, we're doing this v uh, DVD of Wise Guy because, uh, like myself and the people that were in it,